right, welcome everyone. I um, thought we have 10 surprises to get through, so I thought we'll start right away. Um, my name is Bengt. I, um, I'll give you a little bit of background. Oops. Let's see if it comes back. All right. I'll give you a little bit of background about me because the talk is really about um, different perspectives of how you look at the Java platform when you develop the Java platform or when you use the Java platform as a Java developer. So I'll start with a short introduction of who I am. Um, I've been working with Java-related stuff for quite a long time. I started out with, uh, as a Java developer in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and then I started working on the JVM uh, around 2006. Then I, at that time I, I joined BEA, which at that time was uh, developing a JVM called JRocket. So if anybody knows about that JVM, uh, that's what I was working on. Then Oracle came along and bought uh, BA, uh, so I kept working on JRocket, and then a couple of years later, Oracle acquired Sun, and I had to move over to work on the hotspot JVM. And that the big fish here is Oracle Red, it's just pure coincidence, there's no symbolism in that at all, just so you know. Um, and since a couple of years, I'm back at, at working as a Java developer again. Now I'm, I'm working at Looklet, and it's an interesting uh, experience to have been like uh, away from the actual Java development for 10 years and then coming back and see what, what actually happened. So that's what I'm going to try to summarize a bit. Um, if you don't know about Looklet, we're a Swedish company. Um, based in Stockholm, and we, we develop a system to uh, produce fashion images for companies that sell clothes online. So this uh, image you see here, all the different parts of it are real photographies, real images, so the model is a real person, and the red jacket has been shot. Uh, um, it's a real jacket that someone took a picture of. But everything has been taken, all the pictures have been taken at different times and at different places and then combined together to give you a, a photorealistic uh, image that you can use to sell clothes. So that's what we, we do. We help clothes companies to, to produce these images. Uh, and all that means that there's a lot of image processing and all that. And that's done in, in Java. Um, so, when I started working with Java, it was actually quite an amazing time for Java because a lot of things were happening. So, uh, it was pretty new at the time and things were developing quite fast. So, it felt like every time you turned around, there was a new, uh, new framework popping up. So, JUnit came along, Log4j, Servlets, JSPs, Hibernate was a big thing. Uh, well, XML is a framework, but still it was used a lot. Spring came along and uh, we started using JSON instead of that XML stuff. So th there was like all of these things happening all the time. And uh, it, I really got the feeling that the Java language and Java platform is one thing, but it's the whole ecosystem that you have to keep track of. And, and that's a big challenge. Uh, that was what I felt like. Um, and then I switched over to the JVM development, and I not only did I like focus on the JVM, I really focused on one part of the JVM, uh, the garbage collector. Uh, so I was working very focused on that specific part of uh, the JVM. Um, I was focusing so much on it that I even wrote it, uh, or helped writing a book on it. So I, I I was very deep down in actually developing the, the uh, one part of the platform, and I felt like I was um, 
losing track of all this, this whole Java Echo system. Um, but it was a fun time. It was, it's a very interesting thing to do. Um, and now I'm back uh, at Looklet doing Java work again. And we have, um, we actually have quite a, a big focus on Java. We, we even have our client applications written in JavaFX, which is not a very common thing, I think. Uh, we run pretty much all of our backend stuff in, in Java, with some exceptions. We run Java 8, uh, sometimes Java 10. We would, of course, like to run Java 11, but I'll, I'll get to that in my talk. Um, and we run everything in Google Cloud. Uh, and as I mentioned, we do a lot of image processing, so it's sometimes pretty heavy lifting. Um, so that takes me to surprise number one. It's the frameworks. So as I mentioned, I had this feeling that, I, that things were happening very rapidly, and, and uh, the frameworks, they were popping up all the time. Uh, and now I'd been away for 10 years, so I, it was, I was kind of happy to get back to it and interested to learn everything new. But I was also a bit worried that I'd missed out on a lot of things. So when I got to Looklet and realized that these are the frameworks we're using at Looklet, I was kind of, it was comforting because I felt pretty much at home. Um, but it, I was also a bit worried because it felt like so, something should have happened over these years. Um, it's, I, I am exaggerating a little bit because it's, uh, things have happened and especially these frameworks have matured a lot and I think they addressed a lot of problems that were very fundamental and we've moved on to addressing other problems so now we're also doing a lot of uh, there are th a lot of things have happened on like the build side with how you build and integrate stuff and also the whole cloud thing and, and all kinds of frameworks around it like Hadoop or uh, Elasticsearch and all, all kinds of things have evolved outside of this. But it's, uh, it's a little bit surprising to me that, not, that many of these frameworks are still around and still like the main frameworks to use. Um, and that's, then we go on to surprise number two, which is uh, related. It's, uh, uh, I'll click here. So we, I've been through all of the Java graphical user interface frameworks and uh, none of them are good or is good. So the AWT that came out was of course not uh, great, maybe. And then Swing and now JavaFX is feeling like it's also losing track. So I'm a bit surprised that things don't work out for Java on the client side. It seems like it's a, a good fit and there's been many, many attempts and I'm, there are many more frameworks than this that have been tried like SWT and, and so on. But it's, it seems hard to get it to, to take off. So it would, would be nice with a good framework that actually worked. Uh, and related to that is um, that even in the beginning, it was a big problem to distribute Java applications and get the runtime out and get the, your Java application out and running. And that's still a big, big problem. And I'm a bit surprised that it hasn't been addressed in a proper way. There is attempts to it, like Java Web Start and, and things like that, but it doesn't really solve the problem of distributing the runtime and getting and upgrading the runtime. At Looklet, we've built our own, we call it a bootstrapper. It's, a, it's more of a small native application that you download and it installs the things you need and you can, we can upgrade and, and so on. But it feels wrong that everybody has to kind of hand roll their own distribution system. It should be a common way of doing this. Um, 
All right, surprise number three. So as I said, I focused a lot on the garbage collector. And my big surprise is that nobody really cares, uh, which isn't really true. I could also say that everybody cares about the GC. And when I say that nobody cares, uh, I mean that we, um, when, when I was working with a garbage collector, there was a big focus on reducing latencies, reducing the GC pauses that are introduced by the garbage collector. Uh, we had, we of course only got to hear about problems, so there were like big banks or people doing um, uh, high frequency trading, they, they care about every millisecond, so they were very upset about any long pauses. Um, but in what I realize now is that in most cases uh, the normal Java services are running quite well and they have their own problems. They don't really notice any uh, GC pauses if they're five milliseconds longer or shorter doesn't really matter. Um, and when I say that everybody cares about GC, I mean that I have also the feeling that developers have a mental model of how the GC works and what it does and, and, and even that you can outsmart it by calling system.gc sometimes. Or I even see this, runtime get runtime.gc. So you're trying to bypass uh, the, the JVM and the GC logic and outsmart it. And um, um, yeah, do we, does anybody even know the difference between these two? If you look in the, in the JDK, how system.gc is implemented, it's implemented like this. So there's really no need to, to use both. If you wanna make things simple and have people understand your code, you should probably decide on one way. I think system.gc is the one that's recommended and, and so on. I would still recommend not to use it at all because it's uh, the, basically what you're doing when you use one of these is that you, you're saying that with less information that the, than the JVM has, you're able to make a better decision about when to do a, a GC. And that's very rarely true. You, most of the time the GC can do better work if you just leave it alone. It's actually true for, um, for like the JIT compiler as well. It's, it's, uh, if you try to do too many optimizations uh, that you think are smart, um, you can kind of trick the, the, the com Java compiler to uh, miss out on optimizations it could do. So it's normally a good idea to just write code clear and simple in a way that uh, the compiler would recognize and can do good optimization and so on. Um, so, and as I said, most, uh, most Java services have other things than the GC that, that cause uh, time limitations. So it's like network and processing times and, and you ne rarely notice the actual GC pauses. But heap sizing is a problem. So even if you don't care too much about the garbage collector, it's a problem that uh, you only have a limited um, amount of memory to use. Um, so that what I mean with heap sizing is setting the XMX value. So telling your Java application how much memory it's allowed to use. Uh, and that's, um, I'll get into more details about that for my next surprise, <coughs> which is the GC information. So as I said, GC is not a problem, but you want to be able to set your heap size. Um, and to set the heap size, you need to know your, the memory footprint of your application. And that's something that the, the garbage collector can actually help you with. 
So it knows exactly how much is live because a, a garbage collector is actually not collecting garbage. It's actually trying to find out what's alive and, and it's uh, all the objects that are alive. That's your memory footprint that you need to, you need to have a Java heap that is big enough for all your live objects to, to fit. Um, so there are log, uh, logging for, from the GC. You can, um, can enable it with a set of flags for the JVM. Um, it's actually pretty good. Uh, it, um, it maybe wasn't always so good, but I rewrote it, so now it's really good. Um, but it doesn't uh, integrate well with other log frameworks, so it's actually pretty hard to get to the GC logs. So it doesn't, it produces its own file and it doesn't really uh, integrate well with like syslog or anything else that you might want to use. Uh, so it's hard to get to the logs, but even if you get to the logs, it doesn't really give, give you the information you want because the garbage collector uh, logs are created by people like me who are working on the garbage collector and trying to optimize these few milliseconds. So if you're not interested in those exact uh, garbage collector times, but you're interested in your heap size, it doesn't really tell you that, not in a very simple way. This is what a typical GC log looks like. It's a lot of numbers um, and some information. And, and uh, what you actually want in this case is the, on the f one of the full GC lines, the like middle number there is the, the actual live data set. But that's not very clear to, to get to. And it's not clear that the other information is not reliable in this case because it's not looking at the whole heap. So it's, um, I think it would be good with a, with a simpler way to get to that type of information. And there are mbeans, so you can programmatically connect to the runtime and try to get some information uh, through the mbeans. But they're not really useful for this particular case because the mbeans don't give you the information, for example, about whether or not it was a full GC that you can trust. So uh, they're not really good enough. There is actually one thing that uh, could help, which is the flight recorder, uh, or uh, don't know if it, it's called uh, uh, Java flight recorder. It's integrated into the mission control product that's been like a commercial product from Oracle but it's now from Java 11, it's uh, open source and free to use. But then you have to move over to Java 11 and I get to that. Um, so what we do in some of our applications is that we do a very complicated thing. We add these uh, flags to get the GC logging and one of the flags describes which, what the file name is for the logs. So then we take, parse these JVM orgs to find the file and, and then we have a separate thread that reads the file and kind of tails the last few lines and then we have those lines in memory and can include them in any log messages that we pass on to our servers. So that then we can actually, in our like Kibana logs or monitoring, see uh, the, the last few uh, GCs that have happened on a client or a service. But it's very complicated and you still need to know how to read the actual GC logs to, to get the information you want. Um, so that's uh, one of the bigger surprises for me that the, the log files that I thought were really useful are actually not easy to use or even giving you the information you really want. Uh, number five. So the cloud, as I said, we uh, a lot of things felt like it didn't change, but one big change is actually the cloud. And I, it's not just somebody else's computer. It really is a difference in how you, how you deploy and, and run your things. Um, and one thing that I've noticed is that 
it's like we've gone full circle. It, when, when Java first was developed, it was, uh, it really had a, uh, the, it was developed in, under the assumption that it's the only relevant process that should run on the machine. So it was like grabbing all resources from the machine. It, it grabbed all the CPUs, even though at that time it was just one CPU anyway, so it wasn't much to grab, but all the memory and uh, all other resources. Um, but then the computers got more powerful and, and people wanted to run more than one application on their server, which meant that it wasn't such a great idea that, that when, when you just started the Hello World application for Java, it kind of grabbed all available resources. Um, so uh, we actually did a lot of work and a lot of thinking about how can many different JVMs cooperate on the same machine, and if one needs more memory, can someone else uh, like give back some memory and things like that? It was a lot of thinking around that, um, and now with the cloud, we're kind of back to where it was before. That normally you run, you spin up several instances instead, and then each instance actually has just one important process, and and that process should take all the resources because you're actually paying for the resources. So you're paying for extra for extra CPUs or extra for extra memory. So it's important to, to make use of it. So uh, I think we're back to that we want uh, JVM to actually make use of all resources and that would make it simpler. And again, the heap size is a good example because Right now, if you change the, if you increase the memory on an instance in the cloud from four gigabyte to eight gigabyte, you also have to go in and in increase the Java heap size correspondingly. Uh, it would be better if it just worked. Um, and startup uh, is also something that I thought wasn't too important. Uh, when I was uh, working with the JVM because it um, felt like you start, a, it, especially when it comes to servers, that you start a server and then it's running for months and maybe you restart it sometimes during the night, but it's a, it shouldn't be a problem that it takes. I understood the problem in, in the context of like client applications or small script things, but but for servers, I didn't thought it was a problem, but it's actually different all, again in the cloud environment where you quickly want to spin up new instances if you uh, get uh, more load on your system. So you really want startup to be fast and simple. Um, yes, databases. So the JVM has a lot of optimizations for many, many different things. So there's uh, like special optimizations for the operating system and even for specific CPUs and specific CPU architectures and uh, even different memory architectures and, and the network things are also being uh, optimized a little bit, not quite as much. But uh, one big time uh, consumer in, in many applications is the database and database connections. And I think there's very little work done there uh, on the Java side. I mean, we have JDBC, but there's uh, not a lot to make it simple or easy to write um, uh, things like Hibernate. Uh, there's also not much advantage taken of the fact that you have things like the transaction annotation and things like that that you could actually uh, make use of, that you know that here's a transaction going on, maybe it's a bad idea to do a GC right now, things like that. So I think there's a lot of like low-hanging fruit that you could, you could improve many applications by focusing a bit on this. Um, all right, streams and lambdas. Uh, that's how you normally say it right now. When, um, when lambdas were introduced, 
Uh, it was really the lambdas that was the cool feature that people talked about. And that was true also in the JVM because lambdas was the thing that caused trouble. Uh, it was also the cool thing because it made use of the new bytecode invoke dynamic, in which was the, like the first bytecode that was introduced since the beginning of Java. There was a big, it was a big event that we had a new bytecode and it sounded very cool and lambdas was the cool thing and we had to do a lot of work to make it work. Um, and then, so my view was that streams kind of just was a way to, to make lambdas work. But now when we're using it a lot, uh, I realize that it's actually streams that's the cool thing. Uh, it's, uh, we, we just have collections everywhere and it's just so nice to iterate and, uh, and the streams help you bring all your like real logic to the front and, and all the core details just go away. So I now regard lambdas just as a way to make streams work and streams is the cool thing. But either way, it's just very nice to see that it actually has a big impact on what the code looks like and it makes it more readable in my opinion. So I'm, I'm surprised how, how uh, both how well it works and how, how different the code actually becomes if you do it right. All right, so JDK 9, or maybe it should say JDK 11 since we're there right now. Um, it's, it, I, um, where should I start? I, <laughs> I was part of, of JDK 9, that was the last JDK that I was working on. And it was, I mean, people realized that it w internally it was called like JDK 9 would be more of a medicine and JDK 8 was candy b because it, it brought lambdas and everything, but JDK 9 is medicine because we give you module systems and, and jig the Jigsaw project. Um, and I, so I, I knew it's, it's a bit difficult to, to move over to Java 9, but it is actually much harder than I thought. Um, and mostly because of the f different frameworks you use. We had a long time where we, we were on Java 8, but we couldn't move to Java 9 because, because of Spring or Spring Boot that we were using. And right now we still have issues with Logstash that's not supporting uh, Java above 8. Um, so it, it takes time. And actually even uh, now from moving from Java 10 to Java 11, we, we run into uh, trouble with uh, Spring Boot again. So it's um, surprising to me that that it's still, it's so difficult to move past Java 8. And actually I think this graph shows that from, it's from the Java magazine. Um, and it, uh, it was, I think there were 10,000 people or something like that answering questions around which Java version they use in production. Uh, and it's pretty clear that it, this was from the summer, so it, Java 9 had been out for quite a long time, but still a lot of people are stuck on Java 8 and we are too. Um, so uh, I, I guess it's a matter of time because as, long, as soon as the frameworks actually start supporting it, it will be much smoother to move over, but uh, it, it's clear that it's been more difficult to move past Java uh, 9 than, than at least I thought. Um, Right, so um, legacy. So what, what also kind of surprised me is that things that were that considered legacy very early on is still legacy and it's kind of hard to get rid of. So um, it's surprisingly hard to get rid of Java Util Date, for example. Have you seen the Java Util Date dance? No, You've seen? So it's, um, I thought I invented it right now, so I'm surprised you've seen it, but <laughs> it's, um, it goes something like this. You take a Java Util Date like this, and then um, it's a difficult dance, so you have to 
One, two, three, four. It, it's a bit of a river dance, maybe. So that I like to do that when I have to work with Java util date because it's um, just, it's kind of annoying. And one of the reasons why it's so hard to get rid of Java util date is that, uh, well, the Java time library has been around for a long time. So it's easy to just replace the Java util date class, but you often have to serialize the date into REST APIs, which means that you also have to change on the client side. And if you use Jackson for serialization, it doesn't really support it, so you have to do a lot of manual work and set up uh, object mappers the right way and so on. So suddenly it's something that was just changing one class, you have to change in many different uh, applications and it becomes more of a project than you want. So you kind of stay away from it and leave the date there and then it, the next person that comes along has the same problem. So they just stay. Uh, property handling is also messy. Uh, it's uh, a couple of things that are messy with it. It's one thing is that it's hard to, um, to know exactly what, what's being set because there are so many different ways of setting properties, so it's hard to know what eventually is actually being used. Um, but it's also hard to keep it uh, inside, uh, or you pretty much have to keep it inside your binaries if you want, uh, want it to be available easily. And that makes it hard uh, to use the same, same binary in different environments or different places. Um, but it's, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to, to work around. We use something called JITstatic to try to work around this. It's actually an open source project that's being developed by Henrik Hegar that works with us. But uh, it's uh, a way to have a separate server where there's actually a Git repository for all your properties. So you can get version control over your properties and easily make diff, well, diffs and stuff between different environments. And all you have to do, you can run the same binary and just point it to different configurations. Makes it pretty simple. Right, so the last surprise is maybe um, more of an, a meta thing, but uh, the whole uh, strategy for Java, where, where it's actually heading. I mentioned that uh, graphical user interfaces is probably not where Java is going because it seems like JavaFX is gone and uh, nobody else is picking it up, but there I'm not, quite sure what the, how, how Oracle is communicating the strategy right now. Um, one thing is that causes confusion is the Open JDK versus Oracle JDK. Uh, I think as of Java 11, there's pretty much no difference at all in the source code, so it's just a matter of who builds it. Um, version numbering is, yeah, I, I think it seems to be changing all the time, but, um, now we're, I hope we can stay with the one we have now, so at least I'm getting used to it. Um, so I think it uh, would be good with some overall strategy so you would know what, where we're going with Java. So the conclusion. Um, I think for me it's pretty clear that it's, that I had a different perspective when I was working with a JVM compared to when I'm using it. It's also, I think, clear that it's not so much the Java platform itself that causes problems. You, uh, there are lots of other things around that, uh, with the frameworks and with uh, other things that uh, you have to focus on as a Java developer. Um, but there are things that can be be done to, to improve the 
a good experience for a Java developer. So heap sizing is something we talked about. The logging, that it's actually easy to get to the information that you want and need. Um, yeah, graphical user interface, if it should be done at all. Um, and I think it would be good if it could be encouraged that you produce new frameworks, that, that uh, we can get some dynamics back. Um, and distribution, startup, yeah, the things I mentioned. And, and would be nice with a clear strategy for where we're going. Um, that was 10 surprises, so I, I have one, I think I have like a couple minutes left for one more thing. It's not so much a surprise, it's just more of a fun fact. But here's a stack trace from the garbage collector when it crashes. Uh, so we, uh, the garbage collector, our hotspot is, is written in C++. Um, so this is a typical C++ stack trace. Um, so that's what I was used to, to uh, handle stack traces like this. Uh, and here's a typical stack trace from the applications that we work on now. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's different. Um, and it's due to the fact that we have all these frameworks. Uh, that's just the the thing that could potentially help here is if it would be easier to find your own code in this, because there are just um, there's so many frameworks involved that it's sometimes hard to find the code that you're actually changing and you're owning. Oops. Okay. How do I get back? All right. All right. Thanks. That was all I had.